another person who I am deeply honoured to call friend and colleague who herself has made extraordinary contributions to Indigenous peoples' rights but also nation building around the world is Professor Marcia Langton. Professor Marcia Langton has held the foundational chair of the Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne since February 2000 and she has made significant contributions to Australian Indigenous Studies. Her primary research has concerned the engagement between Indigenous peoples and the mining and resource sector through the agreements, treaty, treaties and negotiated settlements. And many of her research projects attest to this, as well as with Indigenous peoples' relation with place, land tenure and legal recognition in Australia. In 1993, she was made a member of the Order of Australia in recognition of her work in anthropology and the advocacy of Aboriginal rights. Professor Marcia Langton is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, a fellow of Trinity College in Melbourne, and is an honorary fellow of the Emmanuel College at the University of Queensland. She was in 2016 honoured as the University of Melbourne Redmond Barry Distinguished Professor and has been an inspiration to many of us. I had the great pleasure of being with Marcia the other night with many Indigenous students who just love and admire her as many of us do. Can I please welcome Professor Marcia Langton to the stage now. I think there's a moment where we've got to get our glasses. <laughs> if we can find them. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia. Uh, good morning, all. Thank you, Chief. Hello, June. Uh, I acknowledge uh, the Wurundjeri people, their elders, uh, past and present, and uh, particularly my mate, Auntie Diane Kerr. Uh, <clears throat> so it is my very great pleasure to uh, introduce this panel. Are there two people missing? Professor Karina Walters. Anyway, uh, so we've heard from Chief Wilton Littlechild. Uh, what an inspiring talk. Um, for me, the key message is that we don't need to carry the burdens of the past. We recognise them, we acknowledge them, but we can be strong and overcome them um, by using strategies such as reconciliation, which has real meaning when we address uh, such horrors of the past as the Canadian Residential College experience um, or our own stolen generations experience with uh, truth telling. And that is what this session uh, is about. Uh, truth telling, the unfinished business. Now, of course, we know that there are many people who don't want to tell the truth. So I'll just tell you a little story, Chief. Uh, we had a Prime Minister a few years ago, Prime Minister John Howard, who was firmly of the view that the stolen generations were not stolen but rescued. And uh, uh, I'd like you to know that at the time, um, this was in the early 2000s, uh, the Canadian High Commissioner in Canberra called a luncheon um, get-together of the Prime Minister's chief advisor on this matter, a woman uh, who invented this term, the rescued generations, uh, clearly for political purposes, um, myself and um, visiting um, Canadian First Nations people and insisted at his residence that we debate this issue. So I was very grateful to the Canadian High Commissioner. I think at that time in Australia, very few people knew about your residential college um, history. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I know that uh, 
the, that day had a big impact on me uh, because there is a truth to be told. There are many truths to be told and it's best that we uh, do it post haste because while the survivors live, they deserve some justice and justice consists amongst many other things, but primarily of truth telling. Uh, and I thank you for your marvellous speech in that regard. So I'm pleased to welcome not just you uh, to this panel uh, so that uh, there can be uh, some responses. Um, next to you is uh, the wonderful June Oscar. June is the Chief Executive Officer of the Maninwantikura Fitzroy Women's Resource Centre and she is a proud Bunumbu woman from the remote town of Fitzroy Crossing in northern Western Australia. June is a champion for Indigenous Australian languages, social justice, women's issues, and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. In 2007, she fought successfully for alcohol restrictions in Fitzroy Crossing. Her focus on Aboriginal children and her determination that we do not sacrifice the health of children for the purported right to buy full strength takeaway alcohol made her a role model for all Australia and certainly one of my heroes. In 2011, in an article appearing in The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, June was named as one of the 50 most influential women in the world for her work in improving the lives of those living in remote Aboriginal communities. She is co-founder of the Yiramale Wesley Studio School and in 2012 she was appointed as an ambassador for children and young people by Western Australian Commissioner for Children and Young People, Michelle Scott. In 2013 she was awarded an Order of Australia in the Queen's Birthday Honours. June was the winner of the Westpac and Financial Review 100 Women of Influence 2013 for social enterprise and not-for-profit category. In 2014, June was awarded the Menzies School of Health Research medallion for her work with fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. In 2016, June was awarded the Desmond Tutu Fellowship for the Global Reconciliation Foundation. Um, <clears throat> it's a great honour to introduce you, June. Uh, <laughs> Professor Karina Walters uh, is a professor and William P. and Ruth Gerberding Endowed Professor in the School of Social Work at the University of Washington in the United States of America. She received her Masters of Social Work in 1990 and PhD in 1995 from the University of California, Los Angeles. An enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma Dr. Walters founded and directs the university-wide interdisciplinary Indigenous Wellness Research Institute. Dr. Walters is also a recipient of the prestigious Fulbright Award, where um, <clears throat> she was an honorary visiting scholar at Ngāpeo Te Maramatanga National Institute for Research Excellence in Maori Development and Advancement at the University of Auckland. Um, in New Zealand or Aotearoa. Her research focuses on historical, social and cultural determinants of physical and mental health among American Indians and Alaska Natives. She has published and presented nationally and internationally on her research and mentors numerous American Indian and Alaska Native junior faculty, researchers, postgraduate, graduate and undergraduate students. She serves as principal investigator on several groundbreaking studies associated with health risk outcomes among American Indian individuals, families and communities funded by the National Institutes of Health. These include the Honor Project, a nationwide health survey that examines the impact of historical trauma, discrimination and other stresses on the health and wellness of Native American, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender and two-spirited men and women and Healthy Hearts Across Generations, a project in collaboration with the Tulalip tribes to design and test a culturally appropriate, feasible and generalizable cardiovascular disease prevention program with American Indians living in the Pacific Northwest. 
So, uh, <clears throat> June, I guess the uh, <clears throat> question on everybody's lips is, uh, what would be your response to um, ch the chief on comparing uh, the stolen generations with the Canadian Residential College program? Um, so we know that lines of people were marched out of the Kimberley in chains in the 19th century and onwards. Many people have gone missing. If you don't mind, I'd like to put that question to you. Thank you, Marcia. Jalonguru Manangare, Palangare. Jalonguru Manangare, Marna, older brother. Marne, older sisters. Jalonguru, Ulala Wara, Yarangayanu, Palangaro. Thank you. Good morning to all of you, to our older brothers, to our older sisters. We are here to share together to find solutions for all of us. Marcia, thank you for that question. And um, can I say, you are a sister that I've greatly admired from way up in the Kimberley and support you and your work for all of us. Um, sadly, from my own personal point of view, is that there has been some very lost opportunities for us here in um, implementing or responding to that question and that need in this country. We have lost many an opportunity to implement the much needed strategies to truly respond with respect, with acknowledgement, with safety to our peoples, individuals, families, generations of Aboriginal people who have experienced historical trauma, whether they be by the forcible removal of children, by the oppressive nature of um, the treatment of our adults by the dominant society in wherever those spaces may be across our land, we have yet to see the true acknowledgement of historical and unresolved trauma responded to in the right way here. And that is, for me, the biggest unfinished business in this country because we have not been able to respond in the way that we needed to or need to, we still continue to see the manifestations of that unresolved trauma in the high incarceration rates, in the pain and suffering of um, preventable deaths in our communities. But we do not, and I do not, give up. We, we continue because we must have hope. The response in the United States has been horrifically inadequate. Um, and I want to point out, I think it's important, um, we, we take our cues from our indigenous relatives and, and just over the imposed border in Canada, and um, they've done incredible work there, and, and, and thank you for, for that. Um, it gives us an opportunity to build something for us. Um, having said that, you know, when I want to acknowledge uh, some important things. One is that part of truth is, is getting the information out there, and we haven't had an adequate opportunity to really tackle and address the um, uh, getting research to really look at this uh, issue. Um, we know that these experiences are real and they're there and they're well documented. Um, uh, the problem with my, I've had back in the States is, and you know, even other indigenous researchers saying, well, maybe historical trauma isn't really a big deal. Maybe it's really contemporary violence that we have to deal with, and that's just, we just need to move on and beyond that. And so there's a, a desire in our communities sometimes to not even talk about this. To me, that's part of the historical trauma response. But, um, but 
one thing I have to remind people is that when I talk about historical trauma and we talk about historical trauma, what all of our relatives are really talking about is the power of love and the power of love that our ancestors held for us so that we can be who we are today. And the other piece is that the, it's not a place of disempowerment by looking at these issues and really truth telling. It's actually a place of incredible power because in that moment when we can reveal those truths and really talk those things through, we have that opportunity to um, heal ourselves. But more importantly, what we're doing is we're healing the next seven generations. And in that moment, I'm also getting an opportunity to heal the previous generation's hurts that they didn't get an opportunity to heal. That's an incredibly powerful place to be. So this isn't about a conversation of disempowerment. It's actually a conversation of power and the love that our ancestors carried for us and the vision they held for us. And our opportunity through these processes is to reconnect to that power and vision of love so that we can then make changes for our future generations. And it's not about behavioral interventions. You know, we've always focused, they're important, but that's not where the antidote is. That's not where it is. It's a spiritual place that needs to happen. It's some, that's a whole other conversation. But I do think that part of it is, um, it, it, it's really about um, making changes at the environmental level. We know that the epigenetic research out there about intergenerational transmission of trauma, that when you get that mark on your cellular material because you've had a traumatic stress in one generation, what changes that mark over time, because it can go away, isn't the individual behavior of that mouse <laughs> when they've done these studies. It's actually changing the environment that produces that stress. So really, this, you know, all these interventions are always focused on changing us, but really it's the environment <laughs> that needs to change. And while that environment changes, then we can do the work that we needed to do to live that power and vision our ancestors held for us. I guess the, um, for me, the most shocking transfer of intergenerational trauma is this problem of fetal alcohol um, syndrome, um, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, because the entirely innocent are being harmed uh, by practices such as drinking alcohol when pregnant, um, well, that's the reason, isn't it? Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, this is surely uh, the environmental issue uh, that will affect generations of Aboriginal children to come. Uh, and I, I, you, your, the research project that you've established there, June, tell us a little about that and um, about this problem as a part of this um, spectrum of disorders related to historical trauma. Uh, thank you. Yes, our community uh, of the Fitzroy Valley engaged in Australia's first ever um, prevalence study research on the impact that alcohol had had on children. And in doing so, we were able to look at a cohort of children born in 2002, 2003, uh, who were at the time around seven and eight years of age, who um, with the expertise of, um, and advice of the paediatricians and child health experts were able to say that was the, um, an age of, at which we could be able to conduct the assessments. And we had spent uh, one and a half years engaging with our community, informing them of this research and why we felt as community leaders it was necessary and hence we received 97% consent rate across our community to conduct this uh, piece of work. And we found, um, to cut the story short, we, we found one in five children in our community from that cohort were living with unique and complex needs from the harmful exposure to alcohol in utero. So what does that mean for us as a, as a community of people living with children at this point in time who have 
a multitude of needs across their lifespan? And how do we protect and respond to supporting those children, their families? How do we um, educate and inform everyone that, that um, cares to know and we think need to know? And so we have been on this journey of truth-telling and facing this hard truth in our community, of um, informing our own mobs, our own people, without shame, without blame, because we know that a mother does not intentionally go out to hurt her unborn child, but we know that women live with uh, multiple stresses in their lives that give rise to trauma and pain, which leads them to um, seeking um, some space in which they can dull that. Uh, we, we understand that. So we were able to have these courageous conversations in our community with our own mobs and at the same time, we were able to bring in the experts from around the world and we looked to Canada and the US um, within the fields of uh, health and child health, but also in uh, family supports and leadership and, and government decision makers in this country. So this work includes and involves everyone. And, um, we have been able to impact um, life in a positive way for all of our children so that they can be the best that they can be. And moving on to the next phase of that work, we have been focusing on how do we as organisations, uh, whether we be non-government organisations, uh, whether we're government services agencies delivering um, much needed services to our regions across the country. Uh, how do we become um, healing informed practices that are um, aware of, of this trauma? And it, it is big work. We have been able to um, bring along some fantastic partners, but we also must uh, acknowledge that there is a well-oiled opposition to this work that um, um, are quite um, quick to say that we are highly emotional women um, just on about, banging on about um, something that's really not a problem. And we still receive those comments as recent as last week. We have the licensees of these um, uh, alcohol outlets, one we own in our own community, and, and others in, in 300 kilometres away from us um, contesting in the liquor licensing courts um, as we speak why the restrictions which we had called for and have been in place since 2007 um, should be lifted now. So, um, you know, this is the ongoing struggles we have with um, industries who argue they have a right to economic um, development and opportunities here at the cost of the trauma and the unresolved trauma that continues to impact our quality of life here in Australia today. I think you're referring there to the Australian Hoteliers Association who I am given you a very hard time, yeah? Yes. Um, so, thank you for that. Um, and so this is then a question for each of you, um, Chief, June and Karina. Uh, so we have some examples of what I think, uh, and tell me if I'm wrong, are <clears throat> the intergenerational impacts of these earlier historical traumas, such as residential, college, uh, policies in Canada or the Stolen Generations policies in Australia uh, and 
the other burdens of history that we know about. So uh, we know now about something about the disabilities that children suffer. One in five in the Fitzroy Valley, um, disabled for life by fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. And I heard on the radio this morning as I was fighting the traffic gridlock to get here, um, that there are 15,000 Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. Uh, so the removal of children from Indigenous families is being replicated by those traumatic and ongoing impacts and probably magnified. I think at, at one stage the count of stolen children was 10,000, but if today we have 15,000 children in out-of-home care and one in five children in at least one area where there's been a comprehensive study suffering from the disabilities of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, we see a magnification of these uh, traumatic impacts. Um, there may be others. So do we, would you like to address that question? Thank you very much. I'll try to link the two. Um, the first one about FASD, because we heard about that as well. But let me talk a little bit about intergenerational trauma, because uh, this was actually brought to our attention by a young woman as well during our early set of hearings. Um, I remember a gathering like this where we were listening to former students talk and a young woman took the floor and she said, what about me? She said, I didn't go to residential school, but my mom and dad did. My brothers and sisters did, but I didn't. But I've been impacted as well in the same way. So we looked at that in the sense of what some call historic trauma. We call it intergenerational trauma because we found that those that were abused in residential school also became abusers. And the trauma that we went through in residential school, we've passed it on to our children and our grandchildren. So they too are impacted by our experience. So when the young woman asked about her, what happens to her, it caused us to really look at intergenerational trauma. And one of the manifestations, of course, was the fetal alcohol. Um, so we looked at FASD and also uh, found that one of the reasons um, this was an issue with us was because judges and lawyers didn't know anything about residential school or FASD or the link between the two. So when one of our calls to action is to ensure that all the lawyers in Canada now must be educated on this history, this residential school history, to learn about treaties to learn about um, the, the Crown Indigenous relationship in Canada, to learn about Indigenous laws. So the judges are called on now to inform themselves about FASD because sometimes they send the individual to prison when they should be sent to treatment. And we think that's an important consideration for judges. Then we call on all the law schools in Canada to begin teaching about the Indian residential school history and legacy in law schools. So that now the judges, the lawyers, and the law students are becoming educated in this, including FS FASD and how it's mischaracterized in court that's resulting in imprisonment of our people rather than in treatment. So the intergenerational trauma, a part of that is us passing our abuse to the children and to our grandchildren in a way of intergenerational trauma. So we're having to come to grip ourselves with that truth in our own communities in a way that we have to educate ourselves uh, about those. And fortunately, we've got some brave mothers with children that have been impacted by alcohol or drugs, FASD, and, and talking to our communities about, about the possibility of those children surviving, and they are. We had one in my community, for example, where uh, he passed 
he graduated from grade 12. And it was because his mother kept supporting him, saying that he could do it. And one of the things we find with FASD is that they will follow instructions very well. So if someone goes to them and say, here, you go sell this drug to that person and give me back the money, they'll do it. But likewise, she said, if you encourage your child to keep studying in school, you'll graduate in grade 12, and she did, he did. So, um, but we're trying to deal with it through the legal community. And then also, by the way, we're asking in one of our calls to action that all the medical schools in Canada, all the nursing schools in Canada, have to now learn about a residential school legacy. Because sometimes it's the police or the judge or the nurse that comes into contact first with us, with our impact from residential school. So we're trying to ensure by our calls to action that they become more aware of this so that they're dealt with in a different manner. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit um, and, and building off of what you, you were saying, Chief. Um, we actually have done some research on looking at the impact of boarding school on contemporary PTSD, depression, and alcohol use. And, and what we found was um, that even after we controlled for contemporary military combat exposure, contemporary childhood and adult sexual violence and physical violence exposure, after controlling for those kinds of things that could explain PTSD or depression or alcohol use, what we found was that the chronicity of events, historically traumatic events, that people's previous ancestors experienced um, was associated with um, alcohol use and abuse, um, prescription drug abuse, as well as um, depression, uh, depressive symptoms. And what we also found was that the children, um, then we looked at folks who themselves have not experienced boarding school, but their parents did and compared them to the ones who didn't, um, didn't have parents who experienced boarding school. And we found the same thing. The kids who had parents who had been in boarding school were much more likely um, to engage in risky behaviors around alcohol and, and drugs than, than the folks who hadn't had that exposure. So there's something about, um, so there's some data to support that there is some kind of process that's happening around that intergenerational transmission of that, that stress response um, and, and behaviors we see. One thing I want to highlight, though, um, is in our work, um, when I go out to the communities to talk about historical trauma, there's three elements that I always talk about, and I'll, I'm kind of giving you a little preview for later today, but you know, there's three things that historical trauma does. It disrupts our ability to fulfill our original instructions as a people. It's designed to do that. It's designed to disrupt our relational way of being in the world to each other, into our bodies, to our medicines, to everything, to land, everything. And it's designed for us to create a narrative about ourselves that's not healthy or well. And so part of our work is to undo all of that. And that's part of the, the approaches that we take to, to look at that. Sometimes it gets kind of confusing in our communities because we confuse, um, because of these events, we start saying some things are cultural when in fact they're historical trauma responses. And a part of our work is to disentangle that. Um, and I'll give you one brief example. When I was working uh, with one particular community, it was my first time going to this community. I had done research on the community and everything, and I was actually asked to be, I was brought in to talk about um, obesity prevention in this particular community, because their children were um, suffering from really high rates of diabetes at a very young age. And so um, I did my homework. I looked at old photos of this community and everything, and I walked in, and I'm not kidding you, there were like 11 grandmas sitting there <laughs> waiting to receive me. And the first thing this one grandma says is when I walked in, and she stands up and she says, okay, don't you be sending any of those skinny white ladies in here to tell us how to be Indian and what you know we need to do with our kids. <laughs> We've always been big. Our babies have always been big. That's how we are as a people. That's not the right body type that these people try and impose on us. So, whoa, okay, so I walked in on that told me a couple of things. First off, it told me she loves her children and she will fight for her kids, so I gotta, I gotta connect to that. It told me as an outsider, even though I'm an indigenous woman, I darn well better watch my P's and Q's and respecting you know, the knowledge of the, the land and the people there. And it told me um, something else, which is there's a narrative there about having big babies, that it's always been this way. And I thought, is that true? Because I looked at pictures and I saw all these old pictures, and these old pictures showed a very lean people. So it was really interesting that this was the narrative 
So I, I said, historical trauma is working here. But you never start with historical trauma. I start with the love. I start with the original instructions. So I asked the grandmas, I said, what were your original teachings that you can share with an outsider about how, how um, you should relate to land and food and all that? And they're like, oh, that's an interesting question. Well, you know, and they started talking. And before you know it, they got into it. And they said, yeah, when we see this butterfly, we know to pick these berries, those kinds of conversations. And they said, you know, we haven't really passed that on to some of our kids. We should do that. And I, then I asked the second important piece about a historical trauma. So you start with the love. The second piece is, when did that get disrupted? What event happened here in the community that disrupted your ability to fulfill your original instructions? And that's when they said, oh, man, that's when we got put on this reservation. You know, we weren't allowed to eat uh, our traditional foods. We couldn't hunt. We couldn't fish. We couldn't do anything like that. And I said, well, what happened? There was a great famine. Everyone started starving and dying. And it was killing us. They brought in this flour. We didn't even know what it was. There's actually, they have actually stories about how that sacks of flour just sat there because they thought it was poison. And little did they know it was. <laughs> so anyways, so they, they said they, they were dying. And I said, so what did your ancestors do to ensure that you could live and you're here now? And they said, oh, well, we made sure that our children always got fed first. As a matter of fact, the, the ones who were fed the most tended to survive. The bigger babies survived. Aha. Uh -huh. All of a sudden, this isn't about being cultural, being big. It's a historical trauma response that was a survival strategy in that generation. And we had to honor that. So I, I don't want to take that away. I want to honor it. Say, OK, that's what your grandmas and grandpas did to help babies survive then. Is it working now? Is it working now? How does it manifest now? And they were talking about hoarding behavior and the experience of boarding school and how you had to eat everything that you could, even you know, just because you weren't sure when you were going to get your next meal. Cooking for 15 people when you only have three people at your table and feeling like you have to eat the whole thing. All those kinds of stories emerged. And then we said, OK, so that's not working now. What do we want to do differently? Because you know, malnourishment. You know, um, ob obesity is just the same flip side. It's the same coin as malnourishment. It's the same thing. You're not properly being nourished. So what are you going to do in your generation to make a difference, to shift it for the next generation? What action do you want to take? So that's how we talked about historical trauma. It's not blaming like we were talking about. It's not about pathologizing. Um, but it's recognizing that sometimes we get in our everyday discourse that this becomes a cultural artifact or it's cultural. And you see it with alcohol in particular in Indian country back in, at home. People try to say alcohol is like, like they, they kind of connect Indians with alcohol, somehow it's cultural. And it's like crazy. Benjamin Franklin introduced alcohol as a policy. He literally said the best way to ex extirpate these savages is by the means of rum. It was introduced on congressional floor as a way to annihilate indigenous people. So those are the stories that have to come out to reset our relationship to alcohol. It, alcohol is not cultural in that way at all for us. So, so it's resetting those relationships to these, these substances because they harm us. So you have that relational understanding. What do we know from our in indigenous teachings? If you m abuse medicines or anything that could be in the medicine world, what can it, what it can do? Medicine has two faces. It could turn around and hurt you. So it's about restoring those relational way of thinking, growing from our original instructions, and that narrative transformation. If we start doing that, we start changing how we talk about this now. So thank you. Um, just quickly, um, it was the grandmothers in our communities, uh, the grandmothers, the great-grandmothers, who noticed the difference in the demand for caregiving that the children who were affected by alcohol needed from them. And they were becoming exhausted in, in the caregiving role, because they, they started to see that these children were very different from, from their own children, for many of these um, grandmothers and great-grandmothers. And that, be, you know, for myself and other, other women working in a women's uh, organization, heard the voices of these grandmothers, and we then approached the child health experts to help us understand this and, and, and investigate it in the way that we needed to. So when we look at fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, we must remind ourselves also that um, these children are wanting the very basics 
that we can give. They want love and care and security. And so they take us back to a place of the basic needs of what it is to be a human being and to, to give love and care. These children are, as Chief Little Child said, they're easily um, manipulated to move into bad spaces and, and engage in, in um, not so very pleasant um, uh, situations and can be at high risk of, of harm, um, you know, multitude of, of harm. But there are also children that can be in a space that um, require very little supervision when they're on country, from my experience. They're out, outdoors. They, when they're at the ceremony ground, they want to participate. Um, I have watched children sit very closely with the song men um, in, this, in our ceremonies. Um, and they watch and they listen and they want to participate and they um, copy the dancers and the, and the singers and that is just so beautiful to see. So whilst we are struggling with how we respond and how we protect future generations of children from being born with brain-based disabilities, like fetal alcohol, which we know is 100% preventable. We can also um, look at the beauty in what we have and the simplicity of what these children teach us. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so there have been some very good suggestions, um, such as educating uh, judges um, and, and having law schools teach uh, <clears throat> subjects, especially, I think, for court officers and the judiciary on um, <clears throat> matters affecting Indigenous people coming before the courts. I've also wondered whether or not there ought to be a, uh, a, a, a procedure of administering the um, diagnostic tool for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder uh, to, well, especially for detained youth. Um, and uh, I think what we're seeing in the prisons now with our very high incarceration rates is a high proportion of people caught in the criminal justice system who are in fact sufferers of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, so can you tell us where we're at with the uh, diagnostic tool, June, and whether or not you think we ought to be uh, recommending that it uh, be used as a routine procedure in schools, prisons, um, youth courts, and so on? Yeah, Th thanks, Marcia. Uh, yes, and look, we, we have been uh, investing um, a lot of time into all of those critical spaces with policing, with education, with the people in, in all the, the range of services provided to our, um, to our communities to, you know, we, we've been saying, don't come into this space if you're not educated about FASD. Um, we've been developing uh, resources for the educators right across the Kimberley now. The, um, every educator must be informed of um, FASD so that there are appropriate responses um, to our children who are um, entering into these, um, these places of learning. Uh, because we all know it is these children who have not been properly understood in terms of their needs who have been labelled the bad kids or the kids that um, aren't interested in, in learning. We know children want to learn. We know everyone learns differently. We know now we need to provide that opportunity and that right to all of our children in all the right spaces and places. Uh, we have been 
uh, impressing upon the, the um, children's courts through the child protection agencies to inform themselves of FASD when they're in these um, meetings with families and extended families around, um, you know, cases that come before or to the attention of child protection officers that they have to understand what are the complexities of needs that not just impact this child but the whole family. Um, and this is a, the, a huge crisis that we're facing, I don't think just um, limited to Western Australia, where in the Kimberley we have 100% of children who are in the state's care um, are Indigenous children. And um, we are working with the department to address that, but we are also um, impressing upon um, the judiciary around effective tools for all of their people to be able to understand um, FASD better and building those partnerships, entering into those spaces is what I believe as, as a leader in, in a community, in my community and, and in Australia today, we must be able to um, have the confidence and the conviction to be able to have these hard um, and courageous conversations around the solutions, because we, we hold the solutions, we hold the answers, and that we can do something about this. And absolutely right with, um, in, in, in terms of the um, Don Dale um, and the inquiry, we have to um, have people who are coming into contact with our children at every point educated about um, all of the impacts that, that um, affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country. We, we must insist on that. Um, we we um, should not allow anyone coming into contact with our children to not be properly informed and deeply informed of the um, potential uh, effects of life and, and uh, experiences. So there's big work and um, I think, um, you know, I, I absolutely believe that we have the best minds that can help inform and change what this future space can look like for us. So it seems to me that in our last five minutes, uh, we've reached the point where uh, perhaps we do have a great deal to learn from Canada um, and our First Nations uh, brothers and sisters there on um, <clears throat> tackling this problem of education so that uh, present and future generations who have inherited the historical traumas in various forms uh, are not... Uh, dealt another unjust blow by being shipped off to out-of-home care, uh, youth detention, uh, prison, because of what are essentially um, uh, disabilities um, brought about by various traumatic impacts um, in their parents and previous generations. So over to you, Chief Little Child. If I may ask the uh, technician to put on, a, on the screen the, the 10 principles of reconciliation that I talked about as we learned from the, the hearings as solutions. Um, I just wanted to connect that with my presentation because going forward, as far as unfinished business, one of the unfinished business with reports usually, as I said, is implementation. So we call for different areas to consider these 10 principles of reconciliation, much like Moana Jackson did yesterday when he talked about the 10 elements of ethics. So we talk about these, uh, for example, the first one being the UN Declaration is a framework for reconciliation. And we need to look at it in that way. Also, secondly, that indigenous peoples have constitutional and treaty rights but importantly, that these rights must be honored and respected. 
Uh, and there's others that take into account traditional knowledge of our peoples to be taken into account. Um, but if you just go through those uh, uh, 10 principles, I wanted to uh, conclude with uh, another connection with the minister yesterday. I think he was talking a lot about action. And much like the word that I used, <laughs> diabetes, there's another word that I've come to use that connects us with uh, Luigi Institute and Dr. Donahue for calling on us yesterday to action. And I was talking about not only about our health, but what we need going forward is reconciliation. <laughs> and I created another word. <laughs> so, so it's reconciliation. But also another one about the words that we use, um, the alcohol that you were talking about in terms of being, uh, uh, there's another word that's used with um, alcohol and they call it spirits, a spirit. And that's not, you know, it's misleading and also sometimes it's uh, trying to entice our own people to, to link them with our spiritual uh, relationship with the land and so on. But, but Juana talked about ethics yesterday and uh, I wanted to conclude his story that he shared with us. You remember he, st he talked about the, uh, the uh, uh, decision to have one minute silence for our forefathers that have gone on, those that have died on this journey. Um, the story actually concludes this way. Now, I was asked to go and ask the chairperson at a United Nations meeting to see if we could have an invocation bef before the meeting, if we could have a, a blessing. So I went to the chairperson and I said, I've been asked to request permission for our elders to open the meeting with a prayer. And he said to me, Mr. Little Child, you know we don't pray at the United Nations. I said, well, it's not really a prayer. It's kind of like an invocation. And so he said, how long is that going to take? You have three minutes. So we asked our four elders. They came with these hand drums. They start singing a prayer song. Eh? Four, four elders are singing. She looks at her watch. She says, Mr. Little Child, it's now seven minutes. I gave you three minutes. How long is this going to take? She said, like you heard yesterday, it was a three-hour prayer <laughs> session. So, but importantly, what happened? The United Nations, for example, talks about bundles of rights. They recognize economic, social, and cultural rights. In a different arena, they talk about civil and political rights. But now there's a new right that's been recognized globally, and that's a spiritual right. So... Our people, indigenous peoples, gave that to the world for spiritual rights to be properly recognized, not through alcohol, but through our prayer. And it's interesting that now we have this new body of rights being recognized, thanks to our elders and our spiritual leaders. And thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Donahue, for the invitation for reconciliation. So thank you. Uh, so let's uh, show our thanks to Chief Wilton, June Oscar and uh, Professor Karina Walters uh, in the usual way. I uh, have very much appreciated uh, your, your, your commentary. Uh, these are, I think, the critical issues. We didn't get to talking about uh, the disappearance of women and children and the violence against women and children. That's probably for another time. But there are so many uh, traumas on the list that we need to address. But in any case, I uh, uh, give you my personal heartfelt thanks for the great truth-telling here. Um, yeah. Please thank Professor Marcia Langton for facilitating such a wonderful thing and once again to the panellists.